As I go through historical archives and files, I sometimes come across photos that make me look twice. When I first saw Fort an der Hockwan Holland, I thought to myself, did somebody beach an old monitor somewhere on the shore? This I need to see, and so do you. It all started with the need to build coastal defenses in Hockde van Holland. It began in 1870 with the completion of the port of Rotterdam and the need to secure it against enemy ships. A fort ought to be placed on the northern bank across the water. After the right design had been chosen, it was constructed between 1881 and 1889 as part of the Dutch coastal defenses. The fort was taken into use in 1889 However, it was already outdated by the turn of the century due to the technical developments in military and warfare, especially the new shell design. Anyway, a design had been chosen that was based on two large turrets, each with two 24 centimeter long guns. In addition, there was room for a smaller turret with two 15 centimeter long guns. The large guns were intended to attack the river, sea, and cover the torpedo barrage. They could also be used to bombard the dunes, an area south of the river. The smaller guns were mainly intended to fire on small crafts, trying to neutralize the torpedo barrage. As the construction started in the spring of 81, a sand bed was laid. Especially where the two large domes were to be placed, 250 wooden poles of 10 meters in length were driven into the ground per dome. The small dome received 99 such poles. A grid was made between the posts between which concrete was poured. The masonry and earthworks were constructed out in the third phase. Now, the fort's guns were protected by cast iron armored turrets. The three domes could not be produced in the Netherlands. So, like turrets at the time, intended for Dutch forts, they were ordered from German manufacturer of Grossum Werk, just like the ones we saw at the Danish fort. The guns for the turrets consisted of four 24 long 30 guns purchased from the German company of Krupp. To provide good production, the armored gun gallery was placed on the landward side of the fort. It was made of rolled iron armor plates between pillars of hard iron placed at an angle. This gives the landward side the look of a beached battleship. In 1909, the fort's complement consisted of 327 men, a captain, two lieutenants, two sergeant majors, 21 sergeants, 24 corporals, and 249 gunners. This number does not include personnel of the torpedo corps. In 1910, initially there was 140 lamps of 20 watts. Later, these lamps were replaced by 40 watt lamps. This required energy could be obtained by running a steam dynamo. However, in peacetime, the necessary energy was supplied by the civilian energy companies. Outdated as it was approaching World War I, the fort, however, was concealed and could not easily be seen from the sea. Before World War I, though, it was agreed that the rate of fire had to be improved by now replacing and using diesel engines for the movement of the turret and to supply new smoke-free powder and half-armored projectiles. Also, the electric lighting had to be installed in the fort. It was also necessary to reinforce the roof. However, none of these improvements had happened by the time World War I broke out. The Netherlands chose to remain neutral, and to safeguard this, mobilization was called on August 1, 1914. Two submarines were set in place to guard the entrance to the harbor, and the fort was put in a state of defense. The fort was not equipped for its full complement of men, however. Yet 90% of the men had to be present to operate all the guns, so chaos reigned on the first day of mobilization. The guns were permanently manned by 30 men and a 100-man guard. The situation was tense. Plans for evacuation of the civilians of the area was drawn up, buildings demolished for a better field of fire, the mood in the fort was not helped by knowing how extremely vulnerable it was to most heavy German fire. Even from the sea, the guns of the fort had a limited range of 7,500 to 8,000 meters. And seeing the much more modern forts being demolished by German guns, 
caused many new plans for improvements of the defense and reinforcement of the fort to be made, yet nothing was done. In the fort there are 107 chambers, 3 kilometers of corridors, there are two bakeries and a water factory that would produce 220,000 liters of fresh water. There is the six cannons and the three gun turrets. By the mid-1920s, it was decided to no longer spend any more money on the aging fort, despite the constant need to defend the harbor entrance. A need that soon arose much faster than anybody had expected, as it often does. After the armored fort in Hock van Holland had been empty for 11 years, it was now again under military occupation from March 29, 1938, due to the perceived imminent danger of war. The 4th School Company of the Regiment Coast Artillery, coming from the training depot in Wissingen, moved back into the fort. The company was commanded by 1st Lieutenant Van Dort as fort commander. This made Hock van Holland a garrison place again. On May 9th, after a telephone warning from the Chief of Naval Staff, a combat-ready state was ordered for all of the Hock van Holland. By 0300, the Netherlands was finally invaded by the German army on 10 May. German paratroopers landed on the southern bank of the Nieuw Waterweg, and available men some 12 non-commissioned officers and 50 corporals and men were sent from the fort to the island of Rosenburg. The detachment returned on 11 May with 12 captured German soldiers and light machine guns. The prisoners were kept at the fort. On the day of the invasion, German seaplanes laid magnetic mines on the Waterweg. It was unsuccessfully tried to make them explode by firing at them from the turret guns. Now, due to the poor maintenance of the guns and lack of experience on the part of the personnel, firing malfunctioned, caused the two 15-centimeter guns and the rotating mechanism of B-Tur to fail on 13 May. Also on 13 May, the air defenses around the village was reinforced by additional anti-aircraft guns and machine guns. This was necessary to secure the departure of the Dutch government and Queen Wilhelmina to England. The ministers of de Geer II's cabinet had come from The Hague with armored cars on 13 May, time to hold one last meeting in the fort, as what to do. The original plan to go to the still safe Zeeland with the British destroyer was abandoned, and were decided to immediately divert to England. At 7.20 p.m. the ministers and the Queen went to Havik on the HMS Windsor. The Netherlands capitulated on May 15th. On the 16th the Germans took over the fort and made it the headquarters of the 205th. So this brings us into the defensive position on the corner. This is all built in brick. That is really, really interesting. There was an off-site powder storage from here. But it all built in brick. Strange, I mean you still see how thick the walls are and the arch doorways. See the small firing ports on both sides. On the wall on here. And through these, now they're slit, but they're made for rifle muskets. This built, this was built in 1881. And at that time, we've even surpassed the needle gun. And it was built with lessons learned from the recent Franco-Prussian War, but still in the same style. 
of one of the old Star Force. Alright, so here you have what would probably have been a 57. You have the firing position of larger caliber weapons into the moat which is behind the wall and you can still see the table where it, would, where it was. Fort was armed with Vickers M18 machine guns, but not many. So this is what the arched hallway on the wings looked like. During the German occupation, the fort was used for various purposes. For example, the men were housed here. The telephone exchange of the Kriegsmarine, workshop and military bakery. It was also used as a warehouse for the Kriegsmarine and there was a small military hospital. Also, it was used as a small jail for a short time. The necessary adjustments were made to the fort for all these purposes. So certainly one can say the fort was versatile and capable of reconfigurations. There was also a large elevator that was built and a new baking oven was installed. Also a hospital and bread factory was installed here with a daily output of 5,000 loaves of bread for 8,000 German soldiers. And of course they had one of the big industrial baking ovens. We actually have his own little rail come out on here. This is very good. And I do love the dough mixer, as if it's still in use just a few days ago, but it's all authentic. And what's interesting is over the oven there's this little alcove, and I'm wondering because the kitchen staff traditionally in the fort had their own separate quarters because they had to get up earlier than the soldiers, but I'm not entirely sure since it's locked. sits on are resting on these bricks. I'm guessing the cannon positions are connected 
by this tunnel here. Because they are very close together. And they are all built in brick. And here's the next cannon wheel. Which is up there. And all brick. That is really something else. So this is the B turret. And you have the smaller turret probably down there. I would imagine that would be the mechanism to turn the turrets, turn the doors down here. And you're looking at some of the damage. And here you have a little bit of plaster. Going on. And another tunnel. And now there are still bricks behind this, they're just plastered. And you'll be up here, there would be an observation dome. And I did notice from above that that has been replaced. And this hallway comes to an end. It's not inconceivable this would have been powder storage. This section has just been plastered and it doesn't have the red bricks exposed here. All right. But now when you're looking at some more we bought up here and I'm not sure this has been filled in. Looks like dead ends. But now you have a little bit more cement on top of the bricks supporting, supporting that upstairs platform upon which the dome is. What of this is original, I am not entirely sure. That will depend on if the guns are in place or not. Yeah. This leads me up to... This leads me up to the... Up to the observation position. So you can get up to the observation dome, seems from two different directions. Oh, this is the back side. These are all these little observation eyes from the outside. As you can see, these are small firing positions where the soldiers could stand here on these platforms. And this was for rifle fire to the rear of the fort, which makes this really interesting. Because they were still working on an all-round defense. Here was been a cannon in one of the larger domes here. But I don't 
don't see a similar small arms ornament from the front. This could have been a recent plug because from down below I saw this hole. Or it could be... No, this is the dome. This is the... Shroud? For lack of a better word. This is what it looks like. This is very interesting. And you have I'm telling you what you have here. This is not a monitor on land. This is totally a monitor on land. This is the walkway. This will be the staircase up to the cannon position. And there it is. Outstanding. Yes. Look, no Magdeburg. They're German made. They're made in Magdeburg. <laughs> of course they are. Because all the, almost all the armament was made by the Germans. And given the, the Franco-Prussian War, how that went, lessons learned about artillery was taught by the Prussian artillery. And they had kept up they have learned a thing or two since Napoleon I. So this really is the evolution. So after the Franco-Prussian War, everybody would come to the Germans for the armaments. Even here with these big cannons, you got to think about it. this fort is built on brick, not reinforcement. And they're very close together. There's an Achilles heel to this little fortress here. So the mechanism for the guns for missing is a very tight walk, but you know what? Not as bad as some of the very narrow holes that post-dated this. This is not the worst walkway I've ever seen. You can still get there by a short, small, spindly staircase as opposed to some of the <laughs> somewhat larger, somewhat smaller um, staircases that we've seen in life in some of these forts. Even in the Maginot Line, some of these fighting positions have been very, very small and tight. In this fort, everything seems to be very large and open, and you have plenty of space, you have plenty of room, you have a lot of rare facing armaments, which is really interesting to me. Tests showed that a thickness of 12 to 15 centimeters would be sufficient. However, for extra protection, taking into account the possibility of future weapons showing up on the battlefield, a thickness of 20 centimeters was chosen. In these plates were small loopholes intended for rifle fire and larger ones 
for the fire of Montagnu machine guns M83. And it was maintained and kept in place by the Germans as it still had some protective defensive measure. And this is part of the cement shroud for the cannon. Now I'm wondering how do we get to the other turret? I don't think I want to go down here. Very small stairs, very small stairwell. Oh, I say very small stairs. This is how much space I get on my foot. The blue tape helps, obviously. There's just a lot of space. On the seaside, the mine barrier consisted on a series of electroshock mines floating some two meters below the surface and anchored to the bottom by steel wires. These mines were connected to the shore by electrical cables and could be activated or deactivated from the fort. Inside, you would work with the power. Just like we've seen before, you would have these shutters, and inside, you would put the light for people working inside these rooms with the power. That is exactly what we've been looking at. Because this fort was entirely centered around the guns and a little bit of post defense. But this was an artillery fort. This was made and designed to lob shells at the enemy. And everything here is made to facilitate that. Store rooms, wine, supplies. There was stores here that this fort could hold the siege for three months. And we had a garrison of five, six hundred men, depending. And it's very compact, although there's a lot more underground stores underneath and rooms and hallways than you would think. And here again is defense for the inside of the moat. And of course with iron shutters that could be slit shut here. And if you slide them shut, you still have a firing hole and observation slits there. I am constantly amazed at the amount of space and tunnels and hallways there are in here. It, uh... <laughs> it's very interesting. It looks fairly small and compact, 
but then you start walking through it and you just see more and more and more. This would be the other stairwell up to the dome up here. The armor turrets, machinery, steam boilers, and guns, however, were removed from the fort in 1943 in order to be melted down and used in the German industry. The resulting hole was to close with a concrete roof that was constructed with a Tobruk on top. Only the rifle gallery still had a defensive value and this was spared. New fortifications were built in the vicinity which were part of the Atlantic Wall. So all this cemented rebar was World War II construction upon which later the renovation had taken place. That makes sense. And this looks like there was actually central heating here in the fort. And this is one of the old munition elevators. So the shells would be loaded here and possibly fused in there and then send up to the turret. After the war, after the Second World War had ended, the fort was used by the Royal Navy and again as naval barracks and later as a warehouse, but thereafter for many decades abandoned until restoration efforts began again. And you really have to love the polished wood windows. It again does give it a little bit of a throwback to the Navy and the old ships of when the sail was great. This is a beautiful, very well designed, laid out fort for the time. Absolutely. However, come battle, there will be problems. Well, there is now. It's a radiator. This is the other scarf on the opposing side where you would have, again, defenses to the sides, into the moat. However, this is bigger than the one with the hospital. where you can fire down one well which is right now an event center which is very nice 
right? But here you have the original tape hole here for the cannon. And then down here, slightly at an angle. That's a note with this. These are not lining up on the line of a tunnel. The tunnel has a slight bend in it because this would be the position firing down the other moat. And indeed, it is. Although it's a little overgrown and there's a shopping cart in it. But let's not split hairs. Plus, in front of this would have been a moat as well. So you would have a water filled ditch right in front of the firing position. And of course you'd have the long side. See how this room has a tilt to it. But you have to appreciate the details of those stairs. So for the long tunnel. Oh, this is the long side. So it lead up to the other, the smaller turret, I'm thinking. I called myself up here. God knows why. This must be either the other dome or where the other cannon position would have been. I think to think that quite possibly the dome was removed. I don't know why I'm crawling through a little tunnel considering there's a door right there. And here, I see a little rebar, which makes me very happy. A little bit of rebar. And here on the other side, the cement is quite clean. It actually looks a little bit like what you expect World War I. Huh. Since I'm crawling. <laughs> that little walk here, there's a very, very small, and you have the red cement, the red from the tunnel, a large tunnel here, you have the red brick, and then it's meeting with what looks like cement with a little bit of rebar again. I see a little metal in there, and there, it's so thin, it, it is rebar, but it's very small. Certainly nothing we see in later wars. So, I'm coming back down here again, trying to find the other entrance. Yeah, the staircase I've definitely seen better years, but I think only spiders come up here now. This is the original ring and the dome had been removed and this is just sort of one of those things that happen. I'm thinking I would have been in a shroud for the cannon dome here and I'm seeing cement in there. I wonder if maybe the dome had been removed and that's why they built this. And this was sort of like an afterthought, even after World War II. Well, in the restoration, they built new domes. Because this does not, not have rebar that's very thick. It does not connect with a red brick. Which leads me to think 
This could have been part of a reconstruction. And maybe the reconstruct of the dome. Oh, this is these stairs. That's just awesome. So, so you see the red brick, red brick. They have some cement, cement, cement fixes. I'm thinking. But there was a door in there. So, and this is the position up here where I just was. Maybe that door. Nope, this staircase, this stairways. So this stairwell is leading up to, yeah, this is leading up to this position. That's what that was. All right, so the cannon's not in there. All right, I guess that's fair enough. I'll take a step up here into the fighting compartment. Of such, yeah, we can call this a fighting compartment. Thick steel plate, like the side of a ship. This really is the side of a ship. This is. Somewhere between an old dreadnought and, <laughs> and an old, old flagship of the fleet, firing ports on the sides. I'm still going to call this a monitor. Looking at the huge powder stores to my right here, in a centralized small fort like this, one can only imagine why the morale was down during World War I after seeing what the huge 420mm shells of the Germans did to some of the forts in Belgium. And knowing that the roof was never reinforced like the French forts, a blast would travel through all these hallways if it had been set in one of the powder stores. Coming up another staircase. I'm imagining I'm coming up to the grate. It's closed. I'm outraged. All right, that's leading up to the lookout. That is door number one. And after having recognized the German World War II cement, everything makes more sense when I look up at these domes, knowing that it was done during the Second World War. This is literally the linkage between the two domes.
So, if anything catastrophic happened in here, such an explosion, that blast would travel all the way through this short hallway and kill everyone in here as well. And since everything here is built in brick, probably everybody. I use a slide for, looks like the observation. A sliding hatch, slides to both sides. I'll be a hatch up there. Now this fort is an absolutely amazing place. It's a beautiful building. It is full of historic detail. But when it comes to battle and combat, it has some problems. Some pretty serious problems. All that beautiful red brick you see is one of them. A lot of brick, very little cement, very little if any rebar, which you didn't do back in the day. And you have the cannon positions, the fighting positions, so close together that one catastrophic failure or detonation or penetration would probably set off the powder magazines, the powder, and kill everyone in the fort. But of course, in 1881, you wouldn't expect aerial bombardment or howitzers firing 400 plus millimeter shells at you. Would you? You build the fort to defend against what you know the enemy has, and maybe if you're a little foresighted, what he might get. Other than that, it will be a waste of money. This simply is an interesting place to see and visit. It is so unique from other fortresses, but one could see how it would be obsolete almost from the beginning, knowing what we know now. I wish, however, that more of the original features had been maintained in an original shape or look or feel. However, I understand the economics behind it now being a venue for weddings and events that keeps it alive, protected and safe from erosion. So at least it will be with us for many, many years to come. But it would be nice to see more of the wartime features to be incorporated in the displays or at least reconstructed. Military departments and politicians don't like what they perceive waste of money. And building fortresses, exuberant fortresses in a time of peace, they really they see that as a waste of money. Of course, they're not the ones fighting it when war finally comes, are they? Behind me is Vanna von Braun's first test stand. Down the road is Diebmus nuclear reactor over there is the Maginot Line and all its amazing forts. I'm visiting them all and I'm bringing them to you. So I really appreciate you like, follow and share what I'm doing trying to document all these important historical locations. And if you feel like you want to watch more pictures or documents that are used for these, go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out with my travels, because gasoline and travel and air for you is expensive, uh, my PayPal is there, protectionserviceint.com. You are more than welcome, but you don't have to. I appreciate all your support and all your help, and I love seeing these locations, and I love bringing them to you.